The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear part of a telephone conversation between a customer and a sales agent. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Now, before we go any further, could you please confirm your full name for me? Of course, it's Marge Thompson. M-A-R-G-E-T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N Thank you, Marge. That's great. Now, Marge, the next thing I'm going to do is provide you with a booking reference. You should quote this in any further communication you have with us. OK, just let me get a pen. Go ahead. Very well. It's 777-000-4422. That's 777-000-4422. Got it? Yes, thank you. And just to confirm... You want to hire a car for 14 days, is that right? Exactly. Right, I can confirm that you'll be issued with a T-Grey Sword Star. Uh, what's this T-Grey Sword thing? Oh, my apologies. That's the model of car we've allocated to you for the hire period. Oh, I see. Sorry, I'm not that well up on car models. No worries. I'll give it to you again. Mind you, it's two words. T-Grey Sword Star. That's T-I-G-R-E... S-W-O-R-D-S-T-A-R. Perfect. Got it. And that's going to be at the airport when I get there on the 2nd of July, right? Right. At 3pm, it'll be there waiting for you. Lovely. Where should I go to collect it? The hire car centre? No. You're arriving at the South Terminal. The hire car centre is in the North Terminal Blue Car Park. Instead, your car will be waiting in the South Terminal Blue Car Park. That'll save you a long walk. Oh, even better. And when do I have to have the car back by? Well, we give you a period of grace. So once it's back by the 17th of July, at or around 6pm, there won't be any problem. Well, as I'm flying back on the 16th, there certainly won't. I'll surely have it back by the return date. Otherwise, I'll be in big trouble. Indeed. Now, what type of insurance would you like? Fully comprehensive, of course. Naturally, right. We'll put you down for the comprehensive then, but I must inform you that there's an excess of £500. After that, you're covered for everything. Fine. That's pretty standard these days. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now, Marge, how would you like to pay today? Do you accept cheques? Unfortunately not. Only a debit or credit card will suffice. Oh, OK. Uh, I have my debit card here. No worries. Excellent. Let me just give you a breakdown of the total cost now. It's £280 for the 14-day vehicle hire, and the insurance is an additional £75. Um, will you be needing a satellite navigation system? How much? £25. No, thank you. I'll use my own. I have one on my mobile. Uh, what about the roaming charges? That could amount to even more than £25. Good point. On second thoughts, I'll take the satellite navigation. I also need tyre chains, is that correct? Not compulsory at this time of year. But I may be travelling up to very high altitudes in the Alps. In that case, perhaps you should hire them too. The chains will set you back another £25. No problem.
So that's £405 by my calculation. Uh, we also have to include 12.5% tax, I'm afraid. Oh, well, if you must. So in total, that's £455.50. Now, let me just... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. two. You will hear part of a podcast for visitors to the popular holiday region called the Trelaw Valley. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 14. The valley and estuary of the River Trelore forms an unspoilt, beautiful landscape, rich in both wildlife and sites of historic interest. There are many ways to explore the area, and public transport links are good. It is possible to leave your car behind and travel by boat, train, or bus, with just short walks in between stops. The Trelore Valley Passenger Ferry runs between villages along the river estuary and provides a link with a train station at Barry, which is about ten minutes' walk from the riverside village of Calton. In the past, the river was the main form of transport in the area, and as in the past, today's ferry service operates according to nature. The river estuary is tidal, and so the ferry timetable differs from day to day, according to the times and height of the tide. The ferry is also seasonal, normally running between April and September, depending on the weather. A timetable for the whole year can be downloaded from the Internet by visiting www.trelorferry.co.uk. If you just want to sit and relax and enjoy the lovely scenery, you can take a river cruise to Calton and back from the nearby city of Plymouth. In the past, steamships brought early tourists along the same route. Queen Victoria and her family enjoyed such a trip in 1856. The journey is quicker these days. The round trip takes between four and five hours, depending on tides and weather. If you prefer, you can travel upriver by boat and return to Plymouth by train. All cruise boats and trains have wheelchair access. For more information and for departure times, ring Plymouth Boat Cruises on 017-528-23104. Trains run several times a day throughout the year between Calton and Plymouth, with various stops in between. They are used by both local commuters and tourists who want to enjoy the beautiful scenery. The highlight of the journey is crossing the river on the stunning viaduct, which was built at the beginning of the 20th century, and towers 120 feet over the water. It is unnecessary to book, and tickets can be bought on the train. For information about fares and timetables, Contact National Rail Enquiries by phone or online. The bus service in the Trelore Valley now connects all train stations and villages in the area. Especially for holidaymakers, there's a rover ticket which can be used at weekends and on national holidays and allows unlimited journeys on those days. The rover ticket provides great value for money 
and is now even cheaper than it was last year. An adult ticket costs £5.50 a day. Senior citizens can travel for £4.50, and a family ticket for up to five people costs just £12. Tickets can be bought on the bus. Now you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. At the center of the Trelor estuary area is the historic riverside village of Kelton. The main road comes into the village from the south, and for those of you who are arriving by bus, it turns left just before the bridge and stops in the lay-by on the left-hand side. From there, it's just a short walk to Kelton's various attractions, if you're arriving by car, you have to leave it in the main car park. Go over the bridge and take the first turning on the right. Then go on until you come to the end of that road. It's the only place to park in Calton, but there's no charge. If you're interested in local history, there's a museum in Calton with farming, fishing, and household implements from the late 19th century. As you come in from the south... Cross the river and go straight on the same road until you reach the end. Also, on the subject of history, you can go and see the old mill, which has recently been renovated and put back into use. Turn left before you come to the bridge, then go straight on and then take the first turning on the right. This leads straight there. If you're interested in arts and crafts, there's a potter studio where you can watch the artist at work. After crossing the bridge, turn left, and it's the second building on the left. Finally, when you feel in need of refreshments, there's a cafe opposite the old boathouse and a picnic area near the mill. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Look at this advertisement for a job. Listen to Philip and Anne talking about the job and fill in the missing words. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Look, here's one that might interest you. What is it? Are you sure? The last one you sent me off to was a disaster. Yes, look. It says they want a junior sales manager and it looks like it's a big international company. That'd be good. You might get to travel. What kind of company is it, though? Let's see. Yes, it's a textile company that seems to import from abroad. That's odd, isn't it? What else? They say the salary is really good. They operate a system of paying you a basic salary and then offering sales commission on top of that. They say it's high. And, oh, look, 
They give you a car to travel round in. Gosh, that's not bad, is it? Uh, uh, do they say anything about experience? Mm, let's see. No, they want someone young with ambition and enthusiasm. Oh yes, they want graduates, so that's okay. You've been to university. Now what else? Let's see. There must be some catch. No, the only thing is you have to travel. But then, that's what the company cars for. Oh, and you have to be able to get on well with other people, because it says you have to be good in a team. Um, perhaps I'll have a closer look at that one. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now, could you tell us more about what you do in your department? I mean, what research are you actually doing at the moment? We're trying to find out as much as we can about dreams. There's one area that we're particularly interested in at the moment, and that is what we call directed dreaming. Directed dreaming. What is that exactly? Let me explain. You know, sometimes if you're having a dream and you wake up in the middle of it, you can sometimes go back to sleep again and go back to the dream. Yes. Well, that is similar to what we call directed dreaming. Now, what I was talking about is a fairly common experience. But real directed dreamers are people who have always complete control over what they dream because they actually know what they're dreaming.、Uh, they can dream what they want. Yes, nearly. Can anyone develop this ability? Well, that's one of the things that we would like to find out. At our centre, we have in fact got three people who are very reliable and who can have these directed dreams quite regularly. And what sort of experiments do you do with them? Well, a few weeks ago, we thought it would be interesting to see if there was any way that these three regular dreamers could communicate with each other in a directed dream while they were sleeping. So one night, we arranged for them all to stay at the centre. Then we asked the three of them.、Uh, there were two men and a woman. We asked them all. To go to a pub that they all knew quite well down by the river, and ask them if they started dreaming to go down there and try to find each other in the dream or three dreams. Yes. So they all went off to sleep, and the next morning we interviewed them all separately and asked them what they had seen. The two men had had dreams and could remember them. And they both said that they had been to the pub and had seen each other and had had a talk, but also both of them said that they hadn't seen the woman, and we thought that was a bit、mm, a bit odd. And then we talked to her, and she told us that she hadn't had a dream at all that night, or she couldn't remember it anyway. Fascinating. So both of the men said she hadn't appeared in their dreams. And that was because she hadn't, in fact, been dreaming. Yes, though of course it could just be a coincidence. But that's the kind of thing that we're trying to find out more about. Well, thank you very much, Doctor Border. It's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about memory in babies and young children. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. We're going to look today at some experiments that have been done on memory in babies and young children. Our memories, it's true to say, work very differently, depending upon whether we are very old, very young, or somewhere in the middle. But when exactly do we start to remember things? And how much can we recall? One of the first questions that we might ask is, do babies have any kind of episodic memory? Can they remember particular events? Obviously, we can't ask them, so how do we find out? Well, one experiment that's been used has produced some interesting results. It's quite simple and involves a baby in its cot, a colourful mobile and a piece of string. It works like this. If you suspend the mobile above the cot and connect the baby's foot to it with the string, the mobile will move every time the baby kicks. Now you can allow time for the baby to learn what happens and enjoy the activity. Then you remove the mobile for a time and reintroduce it some time from 1 to 14 days later. If you look at this table of results, at the top two rows, you can see that what is observed shows that two-month-old babies can remember the trick for up to two days and three-month-old babies for up to a fortnight. And although babies trained on one mobile will respond only if you use the familiar mobile, if you train them on a variety of colours and designs, they will happily respond to each one in turn. Now, looking at the third row on the table, you will see that when they learn to speak, babies as young as 21 months demonstrate an ability to remember events which happened several weeks earlier. And by the time they are two, some children's memories will stretch back over six months, though their recall will be random with little distinction between key events and trivial ones. And very few of these memories, if any, will survive into later life. So, we can conclude from this that even very tiny babies are capable of grasping and remembering a concept. So, how is it that young infants can suddenly remember for a considerably longer period of time? Well, one theory accounting for all of this, and this relates to the next question we might ask, is that memory develops with language. Very young children with limited vocabularies are not good at organising their thoughts. Though they may be capable of storing memories, do they have the ability to retrieve them? One expert has suggested an analogy with books on a library shelf. With infants, he says, it's as if early books are hard to find because they were acquired before the cataloguing system was developed. But even older children forget far more quickly than adults do. In another experiment, several six-year-olds, nine-year-olds and adults were shown a staged incident. In other words, they all watched what they thought was a natural sequence of events. The incident went like this. A lecture, which they were listening to, was suddenly interrupted by something accidentally overturning. In this case, it was a slide projector. To add a third stage, 
and make the recall more demanding, this accident was then followed by an argument. In a memory test the following day, the adults and the nine-year-olds scored an average 70%, and the six-year-olds did only slightly worse. In a retest five months later, the pattern was very different. The adults' memory recall hadn't changed, but the nine-year-olds had slipped to less than 60%, and the six-year-olds could manage little better than 40% recall. In similar experiments with numbers, digit span is showed to vary. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.